The Many Lives of Christian Dior. Episode 2 Double Life. We left him as a teenager, and Christian Dior is now a young man, barely 20 years old. All smiles and this delightful disorder was his sensible haircut. The location is Le Boeuf sur le Toit, a legendary cabaret in the capital and a hotspot of the Rowing Twenties. Il y avait une telle activité intellectuelle. It was a maelstrom of activity, not only literature, but also in music, painting, dance. And you had the impression that as one puts opera glasses in focus, that by starting from the intensive essence of the world, we trained our glasses on Paris. We pointed them at everything that was happening, and that Le Boeuf sur le Toit was the epicenter of the world. And why? I still wonder. I don't think anywhere in the world that so many ideas being brainstormed, where people interested in so many things, and it felt like nowhere where we're living as intensely as at Le sur le The city's artists, dandies, poets, and intellectuals rubbed shoulders here on the Rue Boissy d'Anglas every evening, in freedom and chaos. High society mixed with penniless singers, and everyone made merry according to their means at a table or at the bar, where the less fortunate, like Christian Dior and his friends, could hold court. One might see Picasso, with Olga Kuklova on his arm, and then there was Eric Satie, and especially Jean Cocteau, whom all considered the leading figure. Did he know that one day he would be sharing their table? Unlikely, because remember, for now, his destiny was to become a diplomat. How tedious. Christian did try to come up with a compromise to avoid studying at the prestigious school of Sciences Po, but that's not how his parents regarded it. The time had come to turn from a schoolboy into a student. Driven by my love of architecture, I suggested to my family that I should study at the École des Beaux-Arts. That was an outcry. I was not allowed to join the Bohemians. Madeleine said no, and Christian was obliged to accept her decision. But not entirely. Because if in 1923, Christian Dior was indeed a student at Sciences Po during the day, he was free to spend his evenings perched on a bar stool at Le Boeuf sur le Toit. The young man immediately understood how to make the most of the situation. Above all, to not contradict the decisions of his parents, but instead put up with them. For such are the qualities of diplomats. For Christian, the main thing for now was to bid his time. Behind the image of a studious young man, he was living out his desires to the full. He roamed art galleries, soaked up German expressionist films, and frequented cafes and cabarets alike. He was also a fan of classical dance. He and his friends nicknamed themselves Balletoman, a term they found most amusing. In those wild and frenzied 1920s, one man acted as a mentor for him. We already mentioned him a little earlier, Jean Cocteau. Jean Cocteau had an idiosyncrasy, a fixation he repeated tirelessly, the idea that poetry is everywhere. Christian Dior admired his audacity, an audacity he was sorely lacking himself. Timid and discreet, Christian was content for the moment to just admire him in secret. It was only later, in the 1930s and 40s, that they would forge a real friendship. And it was Cocteau who came up with the famous description, Dior, a nimble genius unique to our time, whose magical name includes God and gold. Still somewhat shy, the Christian of the 1920s had already developed a respectable network. Being curious, he wanted to see and know everything, but certainly not alone. How did I get to know my friends? As we came from different backgrounds, we met purely by chance. 
or rather in obedience of those mysterious laws christened by Goethe with the name of elective affinities. We were just a simple gathering of painters, writers, musicians and designers under the ages of Jean Cocteau and Max Jacob. Among those friends who counted, and who would count all his life, there was first of all another Christian, Christian Berard, known as Bibi a gifted painter who would work extensively for theater and cinema in particular. He distinguished himself as a costume and set designer on La Belle et la Bête, one of Jean Cocteau's masterpieces, released in 1946. Another comrade, another talent, Henri Soguet, a brilliant composer in the tradition of Eric Satie and Claude Debussy, who would compose comic operas and film music. To his friend Christian, he dedicated a pretty waltz in 1947, titled Miss Dior. He also composed the music for ballets, like here, Listen to les Forains, for which Bebe also designed the sonography in 1945. Here is what Soguet had to say about Dior. And it was on a day like this that Christian Dior came to find himself, being not the great, illustrious couturier that we know today, but simply a young man from Passy who, like us, loved the arts, literature, adored ballet and music. We were friends because we had shared tastes, and these shared tastes led us both towards works of art, the theatre, all this extraordinary outpouring of restlessness and newness that marked this fabulous era. In the evening, or not at Le Boeuf sur le Toit, the close group of friends would meet at each other's homes, sometimes in the sumptuous Dior apartment. A few notes on the piano, or perhaps charades, everything was a pretext for laughter and fun. The Granville Carnival, which had been the joy of his childhood, might by then have been a distant memory, but Christian remained a child at heart. All he needed was a lampshade or a bedspread to dress up and amuse his audience. In 1925, the group attended the International Exhibition of Modern Decorative and Industrial Arts, a landmark event. For the occasion, the renowned couturier Paul Poiret devised a brilliant way to attract attention by presenting his collection inside three houseboats moored near the Invalides. They were the scene over several months of a number of glamorous parties. All the crème de la crème of society came together there. Poiret was an indisputable dandy, over-the-top, brilliant, a pure product of the rowing 20s. Women's fashion by then had nothing to do with the pre-war years. Coco Chanel and Jean Patou set the tone. No more tight waists and long dresses. The fashion was simplified into straight and fluid cuts, and women liberated themselves with short, boyish or garçon haircuts. Elle Comme une petite fille gentille, elle s'était fait couper les cheveux en se disant ça m'ira beaucoup mieux. Car les femmes tout It's not certain that Christian Dior was entirely won over by the garçon look. Whatever anyone else said, he was resolute in his belief that nothing could be more elegant than the charming S-shaped silhouette of the Belle Époque. The memory of narrow waists and extravagant hats continued to obsess him. But why refer to that in the middle of the 1920s, when Christian Dior was not yet become the grand couturier we would come to know? He still had to find his own path. He had tried his hand at music, but that was a non-starter. It would be folly to try to compete with his friend Henri Soguet. For a few more years, Christian would remain a mute esthete. He could contemplate, admire, and eagerly respond to the art of others, but had yet to find a way to express his own visions. In the meantime, Christian was gathering knowledge. But in order to fulfill his destiny, Christian Dior first needed to rid himself on the impediment that was getting in the way. The moment finally arrived in 1928. No more pretense. Christian abandoned his studies at Sciences Po. Even his mother was forced to admit that her son would never make a diplomat. Would this mark the beginning of the future's great couturier's career? Not so fast. Christian found himself caught up in his duties of life as a man. 
it being obligatory at the time, he had no choice but to do his military service. He was sent to Versailles as part of a regiment specializing in railway works. As always, Christian adapted to the situation and decided to put this time to good use. And so while carrying railway tracks, he thought about his future. Once his military service was ended, he dreamed of gaining a foothold in a world that had always fascinated him, the art world. And so he joined forces with a friend and opened a gallery. My new and austere life gave me time for contemplation and I meditated on the profession I should choose once I was free. I settled on the most sensible course, one that must have seemed the deepest folly to my parents, and became the director of an art gallery. Indeed, this choice received rather a frosty reception from Madeleine Dior. For her, this gallery project was just another fantasy. A frivolous boyish whim. Nonetheless, his father supported him in the endeavor by giving him a few hundred thousand francs, which allowed him a secure start. The name of Christian's collaborator, Jacques Bonjean, undoubtedly offered some reassurance. Coming from a good family, Bonjean was not a novice. Mom and Dad Dior end up resigning themselves. After all, their son had to have some kind of job. Madeleine, however, had one requirement. Under no circumstances would the Dior name be used. It would therefore be the Galerie Jacques Bonjon. If only Madeleine had realized that their name would later appear on boutiques around the globe. And besides, the gallery was quickly renamed by the irreverent members of his friends group. Unofficially, it was called Jean Bon Dior. Enthusiasm, curiosity and success quickly followed. The two partners collaborated closely with Pierre Coll, a young gallerist who allowed them to exhibit the drawings of Max Jacob. In a few months, the gallery established itself as a focal point for the Parisian avant-garde. Picasso, Miro, Giacometti, the Chirico. And the careers of painters such as the talented Leonard Fini were launched there. And then there was Salvador Dali. Having arrived in France in 1927, he owed the beginnings of his meteoric rise to the young Christian. That he wouldn't forget to pay tribute to him in 1979 at his induction into the Académie des Beaux-Arts. Le troisième, c'était Christian Dior. The third was Christian Dior, who was not yet known at the time. He wore a bowler hat and carried a very fine umbrella. And under his arm was a small Dali painting which he was trying to convince everyone wasn't half bad. And he sold that painting. Christian Dior flourished in this work, finally living out his passion. He took artistic risks that often proved very judicious. And just like that, Christian might well have found the job of his dreams. In this wonderful time, this time of youth, 1928 was a vintage year for me. Everything seemed to thrive. Our gallery had had a fairly promising start, which reassured my family. It should be noted that, since 1925, the virus of speculation had infiltrated the social strata, which were traditionally best insulated from the hideous appetite for money. Everything had to have a return. Business and art as much as the stock market. Investing was the order of the day. The future looked bright, and it seemed that these buoyant times were there to stay. The work of artists with soaring reputation attracted reckless sums of money. On the other side of the Atlantic, however, this wild dream of unending abundance was about to come to a sudden end. Having inflated as much as it could, the bubble was ready to burst. Suddenly, on October 29, optimism collapsed. On October 24, at the New York Stock Exchange, speculators started setting off frequent numbers of shares. Panic seized the small shareholders. By noon, 12 million shares had been sold. 
Il y aura cinq jours de répit, Five days later, et c'est le mardi noir. Came Black Tuesday. 16 millions d'actions 16 million shares are sold that day. Ne pas the others do not find buyers, even at the lowest price. La grande dépression the Great Depression had begun. In France, people initially thought they would escape the crisis that had crippled the American economy. But Christian Dior did not share the optimism. 1930. At the end of the vacation came a portent which alarmed me more than the stock market crash. In our empty house, a mirror came unhooked by itself and smashed on the floor in a thousand smithereens. A broken mirror. So what? For Christian, this was not nothing. He was superstitious, very genuinely so. By age 14, he had already consulted his first clairvoyant. He would spend his life on the outlook for signs and wary of bad omens, carefully keeping a collection of charms at home. He was completely convinced that this broken mirror foretold an approaching misfortune. One might have wished to tell him that he was wrong, to tell him not to believe this nonsense. But the fear became reality, and the next few years would probably be the most difficult of his life. <laughs> 